Welcome to the Founders Field Note podcast, where you can learn from founders how to be a founder, including myself. I'm Jason Klug, founder CEO of Klugonics Group, as well as a serial entrepreneur. So this week, we have our friend and client, Stephen Wilcox. He's the founder of the Park It. You can find him at parkitmovement.com. He made this beautiful chair that I'm sitting in right now. This is basically the revamped version of the classic lawn chair made to perfection. So listen in, learn about the long development process. It is quite a complex chair. The breakthrough success on Kickstarter. And then, of course, the growth that he's currently experiencing. A lot of good points here, a lot of good field notes to take away into your next direct-to-consumer brand or whatever you're working on. All right, so it's a casual conversation. We're here. There's no script, okay? It's like we're talking about stuff we've talked about a million times in the past. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. So You're going to have to pull a lot of it out of me because my brain has, come out. We'll my brain's been drinks. living in the future more than it's been living in the past, which is a good thing, but it's, uh, yeah. you know, a lot has happened in just like two and a half years of being in business. Has it only been two and a half years? It's been two and a half years of... Wait, two and a half years was like COVID time. Yeah, it's been two and a half years of selling. Of selling, it's been a year and a half of shipping, and we've already. Did you, did you do your first fulfillment during COVID? Then our first fulfillment was in May of 2021. 2021. Yeah. Wow. That was our first container shipment. So then we started development wise. We in 2019. We started development wise in the fall of 2018. Oh wow! And I was contracting with like, you know, yeah. 15 to 20 different digital brands at the time <laughs> wow. and whatever I could post you know, Oakley. Yeah. Whatever I could muscle out of the, my life living expenses at the time went to product development and design. So it took us a little bit of time to get, you know, buying, around the horn uh, on everything, but buying lawn chair USA chairs to see if they're good yeah, enough and exactly. they were never good enough. No, they were just like the style wasn't there, and and um, the durability wasn't there, mm-hmm. and the look wasn't there, and the mm-hmm. like the like one of the things that in you and I have discussed this in the past is like, you know, when Parkett started, it was a brand far before it was a product, right. and it was about you know inspiring people to go outside and uh, to go play in the woods and mm-hmm. go swim in the lake and do mm-hmm. the ice. Like if you're in the cold and you want to take an ice plunge in that lake, go do it. Mm-hmm. Like you're going to find that your life's better and more joyful from creating those memories with people. Yeah. But it was never um, like figuring out what the product was going to be that facilitated that was kind of my biggest challenge coming from a marketing and brand space with like, like you mentioned, Oakley and Quicksilver. But did you know it was going to be a chair? I never knew it was going to be a chair until um, actually like kind of one of those like serendipitous I'm going to build a business mm-hmm. product moments. Mm-hmm. Um, I was on a camping trip with a couple buddies. Mm-hmm. There's actually like three layers to the story. The shortest one is we're on a camping trip. My buddy sits down in a chair and it like breaks on him. And I kind of realized that these things have not been built well for a long time. Yeah. And no one's innovated them and someone can do that. And that person can be mm-hmm. me. Um, but the longer version of the story is that I actually found like an old 1950s and 60s lawn chair at a garage sale in Newport Beach. The green one. Uh, older than that one. Like so we're talking like that green one, before you that one, like okay. rust bucket, like mm-hmm. thing was rusted and destroyed, but it just had like the vibe to it. Cause it mm-hmm. had that crisscross webbing and those, the bent radius aluminum that like, you know, it's kind of classic and you see it in movies all the time too, mm-hmm. when they reference historical like stories. Yeah. And so I picked this thing up from a garage sale for basically like, you know, five bucks threw it in my car and would bring it places. And people would ask me like, where'd you get this? And I was like, I found it at a garage sale. And mm-hmm. that was kind of like the first, like, Oh, well, no one's like, find can no one can find this anywhere like yeah, so maybe was, and i kept getting that question enough that i was like maybe i should figure out how to build one mm-hmm. and then one of my best friends was like it'd be super cool if we could put sick patterns on chairs and yeah. i was like huh that's another good idea and like at the end of the day like when my buddy sat in the chair and it broke and those other two experiences that happened like it mm-hmm. showed me where like the brand that i always wanted to build mm-hmm. could be you know ultimately centered around this product that yeah. and you were doing what you were hoping your brand would represent at the time. Exactly. So it's serendipitous. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's like, like the whole goal was to like, for me personally, like coming into the action sports space, it was always to assimilate my work career 
with a brand and a business that has a lifestyle that like mm. actually promotes the activities we like to do. Mm. You don't hear a lot of stories about guys who work on wall street mm -hmm. that in their twenties and thirties jet off to Australia for three weeks and go surfing True, and like are supported in doing that. Yeah. And in the world that I wanted to grow up in and in the business that I wanted to build and the culture that I wanted to have is like, you have the opportunity to go experience all these places and the world is a lot smaller of a place than we think it is. All you have to do is get on a plane and, 14 hours we can be in germany drinking beers for oktoberfest yeah and you know like especially right out of salt lake with our wonderful hub that we yeah have. It's, it's an easy <laughs> it's an easy thing to do if you yeah. really just decide to do it yeah and it makes the world smaller and mm -hmm. i think that you know at the end of the day if you can go out and adventure and meet people that believe in those same things like you're going to find some of the best people you've ever met and that's kind of the way that I lived out my early 20s before starting Park It and wanted to reinvigorate that into a brand that could do the same. So you brought us a, a chair that inspired it too. So this has been the second version that inspired it, the green one. Yep. When you had added a strap, you yeah. had added some other tweaks. So you started experimenting with uh, an existing chair. Yeah, we had, uh, so the first thing we did with that old rust bucket one, we actually went to me and a buddy of mine, um, drove to a fabric store mm. in like mission beach, San Diego area mm. and like found like four fabrics we liked. And then we went home and we actually cut those with like, you know, scotch scissors and mm -hmm. like, you know, taped them and like figured out how to attach them to that rust bucket one. And that was like, wow, this might actually like look cool too, if we do this correctly and, um, found ultimately a company that sold that old 1950s lawn chair, mm -hmm. which we already mentioned and ordered one of those. And then we'll I started beep going out their name. I started working so on, <laughs> I started, yeah, they still sell. Um, yeah. so I started working on, we haven't, we haven't worked them out of the market yet, uh -huh. but no, yeah. um, we, we took a golf strap and we actually like took a golf strap off of a golf bag. Yeah. Figured the out golf how to bag that, you still that use to it. Today, right? Is it? I got rid of that golf bag. Okay. It's a, you know, <laughs> we don't need that thing anymore, but got that yeah. golf bag uh, strap, jerry rigged to the chair. Mm -hmm. um, and then we jerry rigged it in a way that allowed for like when the chair folded to like act as a carrying case. Right. Yep. And then you could carry it on your back hands free. Mm -hmm. And my first test was actually with my fiance. Um, it was our first Valentine's Day date. And like, I pulled out this chair with a golf strap bag attached to it. And she's like looking at me like, what the heck are you doing? And I'm like, I'm carrying everything to the beach. And I had like a little portable grill that I had bought with mm. like steaks inside and asparagus oh, yeah. and like the gas thing. And I'm like mm -hmm. carrying everything over there. And I'm like, this is great. Like, yeah. this is what we, and then I had a blanket stuffed in the chair the way it was folded and the golf strap, strap worked and, mm -hmm. you know, definitely not retail ready, but that was kind of like the first, like, this can be something. That was validating of the, the ease of use. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that led to a lot of, like this is one of the other funny parts of the story that I, I almost forgot, but um, I spent like three or four months just driving around San Diego, talking to different metal welders and woodworkers, asking them if they could build this idea that I had. And they would just yeah. send me to the next guy, send me the next guy, yeah. send me the next guy. And at one point I'm like, I'm spending time just driving around San Diego, Orange and Los Angeles County, trying to find some like builder. It would have been LinkedIn. a $500 chair too. Yeah. <laughs> linked, <laughs> went on LinkedIn and just wrote, I have an idea for a consumer good. I don't want to talk about the idea. I just need to find like an engineering group that can help with it. And a guy that I used to work with at Oakley, who also makes a product with you. Tyler. Tyler um, Green. Thank you, Tyler. Tyler hit me up and said, you need to talk to these guys in Utah called yeah. Cludonics. Jason's the founder over there. They've helped us design our product. Yeah. And it was a, a truck tailgate with padding and like, you yeah, know, the pop cash, up seats and cash truck pad. Yep. Still around today. And, uh, yeah. And I was like, well, if they can make this, they can definitely figure out this chair. And, uh, thank God we found you guys. Cause, yeah, cause I don't you, know you got on have. a plane and flew out like right away. Mm -hmm. We did our first meeting in person. Mm -hmm. Did Lauren come to that? I can't remember. No, she came to the second one. Yep. Yeah. And that's where it started. That's where we figured out the, the cooler, the, um, the different strap layouts. What else did we come up with? Figuring out the pattern styles that we could do. I mean, all that stuff. The CAD modeling, the prototyping. Yeah. The first prototype when we did the webbing and we like spray painted the webbing onto I mean, like some sometimes you know, you nylon have to do, right? just to see the visual <laughs> aesthetic. Like, does this work visually? And yeah. Yeah. That was fun. Aaron did that in his garage. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good effort. But 
Well, so now where are we at today? So that was starting. That was what? That was 20. That's that was crazy. It was 2019. But t- getting a chair to market takes some time, as you've learned. We really just- There's a lot of work to do between you know concept to mass production with something that complex. Yeah. We really just covered 2018 fall to 2019 fall. Yeah. So and the, that was- The Kickstarter went up when? And the Kickstarter was supposed to launch on March 18th, 2020, Mm -hmm. which if we all think back to March 18th, 2020, that was the same day everyone panicked and bought toilet paper. That's crazy. Yeah. March. That's right. I remember that. March 16th, my brother called me and said, are you sure you're going to go through with this? And like, Uh you know, every entrepreneurial book is like, just blow through the walls. Don't worry. Like, you know, figure out how to navigate it. Well, you'd put so much work up front Mm -hmm. into it at that point where I'm sure you had the confidence, but of course- I remember you were questioning if you're going to do it or not. I think waiting the the month or two because that's didn't, isn't that about how much you waited like a month or two. Yeah, it turned out to be like the perfect storm. Yeah, because you waited till everybody was like you know kind of settled into being remote and mm-hmm. stuff, and then at that point everybody was like on their phones and stuff more. Mm-hmm. So I felt like, and that's when when e-commerce started to get their uptick. So I guess yeah. that did work out. For it your, all it so all that turned into like was a good decision at the time. Yeah it, yeah, it turned from like this is this business. I remember like we we pulled the plug. We put out one of those posts that said to everyone like as an outdoor brand, we don't want to mm-hmm. in like invite outdoor activities while this is all happening. Yeah, kind of echoing like what Altira and the like the ski resorts were saying. Mm-hmm. And then you know I remember hanging out with some friends in like a little backyard like that next day for St. Patrick's Day mm-hmm. before the world really shut down. Oh yeah. And like people were asking me like how I felt about it. And I was like, you know, like I was like still feeling positive. Then? Yeah, I had the prototype, okay. but was still feeling positive. The next day, March 18th, mm-hmm. when everything like went absolutely bananas, I was like, this may never get off the ground. Like yeah, that was I kind of the mindset talking I was to you in. When you had that, yeah. And I was thinking like, all right, well, at least at this point, like I've only lost what I've invested in the product design. I've learned a lot about product design. Yeah. Like the world's going to be different and who knows what we have. And like within yeah. two weeks, three weeks where I live in San Diego County, we don't ever deal with beach parking issues. Mm. And I remember like coming pull, coming home from something and I pulled up to the, the house and there was, I couldn't find a parking spot right in front of my house or within my neighbor's houses. Like I had yeah. to actually like find a spot. Mm-hmm couple blocks away and walk to my house, which is only something you experience in Newport beach or Pacific beach. Yeah. You don't experience that where we live. Everybody wanted to get outside. Everyone wanted to be outside. Yeah. And it kind of like re kicked me with like, Oh my God, this is actually happening. Yeah. Like everyone's here. They don't have to be in their office. They're at their vacation home in Havasu. They're at their vacation home on the beach. Mm-hmm. They're like, people aren't. Or they're in their RVs. Oh, yep. And, uh, Warren hadn't made yet, but was thinking about and it. And all the, the big companies had <laughs> decided to like pull back on ad spend yeah, because they were worried about people not buying stuff with all the chaos. So making uh, ad spend less expensive yeah, for the, the CPMs, aggressive startups. <laughs> the CPMs dropped dramatically from the guys yeah, that I spoke with. I remember with. that. Yeah. And, uh, I just was like, put in the gear. We got to turn this thing back on and crank it back yeah. up. And so we spent about two weeks, like with some like lead prep and like mm-hmm. reinvigorating of our mm-hmm. list and, uh, we launched on May 6th. So the other idea there was to, our idea the whole time was at March 18th after St. Mm-hmm. Patrick's Day and March and May 6th after Cinco de Mayo to catch people at home, you know, potentially yeah. after a big night out, yeah. scrolling their phones and getting was, hit with ads. It was 4 a.m. And uh, Jason was our first backer. Was it 4 a.m.? It was 4 a.m. that we launched. I set an alarm when you said, and I sat there and refreshed. Yep. And then as soon as it popped up, I got it. Yeah. My best friend who I've been friends with since I was three years old came over to the house to celebrate it with me at 4 a.m. Mm-hmm. We cracked beers at 4 a.m. Mm-hmm. And then he got on to try and be the first guy. And then all Sorry, of a sudden he's you. like, oh, crap, I'm not first. <laughs> so you beat him. Yeah. And uh, we're very appreciative of that. But that, that very exciting. first day we did 75 grand. Yeah, that was that was a huge, that was like massive validation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we did 75 grand on day one. And like our forecast was like, we might hit. 10. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that told us like, oh my God, we have a real business here. Yeah. And it's actually another side part to that whole story is I actually got fired that same day from one of my clients. Really? Because I was still contracting with a number of people. Yeah. One of them caught wind that I had a business in e-commerce of Mm. all things that I was helping him with. Hmm. And, uh, he came around and was like, I see you have another commitment. And I was like, yeah. He's like, all right, cool. We're done. Here's your check. Oh. And I was like, interesting. We didn't need that anymore. I didn't, like, not necessarily that I didn't need that anymore, well, but I was yeah, like, is, I just raised $75,000 with an e commerce product your that's skills. coming to the market, and you need this. You, you've hired me for this. So yeah. that was a, a unique, you know, 
experience too. On yeah. one of the best days for Park It, I got fired at the same time. The the <laughs> and Kickstarters are, um, you know, it, like as I've seen and as you've learned, they're way more difficult than people think. Yeah, everybody comes, you know, bringing a product to market, think, oh, we'll just do a Kickstarter, and it's like, you know, I mean, you, you're talking, you had almost a year and a half before your Kickstarter, mm -hmm. you know, and I even Dry was similar. It was, you know, I think we did like eight months, but obviously we it showed because what we did in the entire campaign is what you did in your first day because you did all that prep you know but like i mean there's so much that goes into that around you know not only pre-campaign but during campaign post campaign talk about that experience a little bit yeah so the campaign was crazy in the sense of just like I remember you showed me this app called like kick track and you were like, this kick track app will take yeah. your data from your yeah. sales and like kind of project where you're going to end up. And like after day one, it was like, you're going to end up at 3 million. And I was like, Oh my, what are we? Yeah. If you did 70 grand a day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was like, that's going to be crazy. Yeah. Um, but no, I also was like prepared. I'd done enough research to know that like your first week on Kickstarter is really like the biggest week. Yeah. Then you have a lot of fall off. And, and then, then you'll have like bell curve. Yep. Yeah. And then you'll have some ramp up at the end again, where you can like run a bunch of like last chance, best pricing deals yeah. are expiring type of campaigns. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was a lot of just like, r like shooting from the hip, like mm -hmm. paying attention to like what was happening, what could we get our hands on that would be positive, like press or, you know, awareness for the brand. Um, like calling influencers quickly. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Kickstarter community does really well is collaboration. So we get hit up, like if you have a, especially if you're trending too, which oh, we the ended up the message collapse. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we those actually, are hot. we got uh, listed as trending on Kickstarter. So we ended up on Kickstarter's homepage. Yep. That helps. Which is huge. Did you use that guy in the Philippines that I recommend? We did you? talk to him. Cause he's pretty, that, that he helps. helped with some rankings mid through. Yeah. Yep. That helps. Um, and like, you know, being in that spot mm -hmm. enables you to just be seen by anyone who lands on the kickstarter.com homepage. Mm -hmm. And so people I, see that clout and then want to, share so they'll post you in their messages and then mm -hmm. you're posted in your messages and yep. it builds i i think like you know i think we we're close to like 15 percent of our campaign was from those alone yeah we had a pretty really strong good. amount from that yeah we did have a couple we, we were we were doing so many of them that we did have a couple people be like are these updates or just cross promotions and i was like yeah. uh at the moment they're cross promotions yeah. you'll get proper updates when the campaign ends yeah and uh, we ended up, you know, we pre-sold 3,000 units in 30 days and Which is that awesome. brought in half a million bucks. And mm -hmm. it was like, all right, we have this to start a business. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the funny stories associated with that is I actually like when you set up a Kickstarter account, you have to set up a bank account and you mm -hmm. have to link it and they have to verify it. It's part of like the verification process, as you know. And we didn't have a business bank account yet because mm -hmm. everything was just me. Mm -hmm. So I just associated like my personal Wells Fargo to the account. Oh. And then I got this giant deposit of half a million bucks into my Wells Fargo account uh -oh. and it's COVID season. So everyone's, you know, like going in the banks with masks on and standing six feet apart. And mm. I had to walk up to the teller and I didn't want to say like the amount that I was asking to have like, you know, transferred, transferred or yeah. cut it into a cashier's check. Yeah. And, um, I just put it down on a phone and like held it up to her and like, I could see her eyebrows were like, are we getting robbed? And yeah. I'm like, it's in there. I promise she yeah. like opens the account. You can see her eyebrows like, Oh my God, this is really here. Yeah. And, uh, we took the money out of the bank and it was like, you know, I've never walked out of a bank with half a million. I can say that I've walked out of a bank with so, half a million dollars wearing a mask. Did you just have a check? Yeah. I got a, I got, I wanted a physical check and to take a photo with another, it. And then I went to another bank, bank and deposited oh. it for our business account. Yeah. You know, That's small, exciting. What does small that do banks for are a little taxes, help, more though? helpful to small businesses. Was that weird tax wise? No, because it was just me. Okay. And it was a clean transfer. That's good. And it was a, like everything. Yeah, just total could, amount. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, but that's always the thing, right? Is you, you see these Kickstarters that raise, you know, million plus or whatever, and they crush it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, then you have to actually fulfill. Yeah. So l l that's the hard part, right? Yeah. Well, it's I guess they're both hard, but that's like, you know, the other, other type of hard. Well, that's the part <laughs> where it's like, you know, you, you kind of take – you kind of take calling this founders field notes. It's like, you have no field notes. <laughs> yeah. Like you're like, my background is this. I know how to do this. Mm -hmm. I enjoy branding and marketing and building like the personality that's behind a business. Mm -hmm. That's where my skill sets always like, like excelled. Yeah. 
I knew nothing about supply chain management. I just knew that product got put on ships and those ships went to Long Beach and they ended up in warehouses. And yeah. like, that was like my understanding of like how it works. Takes a few, few days. And I remember, <laughs> you know, starting conversations with the group in China, Onyx 360, helping us, you know, ultimately source the factories and figure out some of the smaller, finer details that we didn't figure out through prototyping. And they're like, well, what kind of screw do you want? Do you want it to be like flathead or like rounded? Do mm-hmm. you want it to be like, like really like, like narrow, like all these really tiny details that I'm like, I have no idea. Yeah. What's the benefit to one? Is there, is there a yeah. benefit to a, a different trial one? and error? And test um, this one, test that one. Yeah. Yeah. And that I was like, it gave me a real appreciation for like all the groundwork that a lot of businesses go through right to just get their product into the consumer's hands especially super complex stuff like a chair with that many parts yeah and like and i also think that i look at products now completely from a completely different lens Mm -hmm. and i think feedback from the consumer is really healthy you should get it yeah but i also now as a consumer like look at a product and think to myself this isn't right but I bet you they've tried five to six times to get this right. And they right. still are like trying to get like the right piece of feedback back. Yeah. Or you see, um, or you see products and will recognize changes they have made. Mm-hmm. Have you noticed that? Yeah. Like that Stanley cup that yeah. everybody has. Have you seen the, the new version, mm-hmm. which is the one you brought mm-hmm. versus the old version, which I have here, the, the little tweaks they did with adding rubber here and stuff like that. And knowing that, you know, it's okay to let a product be slightly liquid and let it evolve over yeah. time and let it improve. It yep. doesn't hurt anything. It just, you know, it's fine. So like the first version of the product, it's okay if it's, you know, even 90% of the way there. Yeah. You know, and that's, even 85% of the way there. Cause, and and yeah. being a guy who was on the marketing teams of like Oakley and Quicksilver, like mm-hmm. they... They, they don't release a product that's not a hundred percent yeah. because yeah. you know, they have the history, they have the resources, they totally. have the teams, they, they mm-hmm. it all exist. Mm-hmm. So that was the second part of like fulfillment was like figuring out the product, mm-hmm. getting golden samples made at the factory level, mm-hmm. testing those golden samples mm-hmm. and finding out like crap, that part broke. Yeah. And you're like, well, theoretically we thought that was going to work and like never having experienced that, mm-hmm. that was like a really big jolt to me, to me as kind of a founder Yeah, and being like, it's, these are the things that like make or break a business are these it's small okay. little things. It's okay if and that it's, failure happens. And then. it's exactly. And it's okay yeah. that that failure happens when it happens because mm-hmm. now you've learned yeah. and now you can improve upon it. Whereas if that failure, you know, it's like when you think of what's dealing, what Toyota's dealing with right now with their Tundras having some issues. No, I didn't know about oh, that. Toyota has been having some major recall issues on the Tundras, okay. which I'm waiting for round two to come out specifically because of the news I've, I've seen on it. Okay. They'll fix it because it's Toyota. Right. Um, yeah. But they've had some recall issues and it's like, you don't want to find that out after you've shipped all these to all these customers. Oh, you want to find that out as early as you possibly can. And, and with that, you have to think about not just the manufacturing side of it, you have to think about all the dealerships and the shops that are going to service it under mm-hmm. warranty, yep. the cost, the timing, you know, squeezing it into all of the, you know, the labor time around all of the normal standard procedure, you know, mechanic stuff they have to work on yep. and fixes they have to work on. I mean, yeah, every time I see a car recall, it does make me like, yeah, I feel bad for him. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it's something that yeah. before starting a product, I was like, oh, all right, cool. Well, yeah. uh, Ford's got to fix a recall. It happens. Now I'm like, yeah, Ooh, yeah. that's going to, that's going to be a, that's gonna be a project. Yeah. And so it's, it's great to go through that whole process and like narrow down all that stuff on the parket chair and mm-hmm. like figure out what we is that we need to fix. And like, we're still constantly refining today. Like I joke with people that we're on kind of like version 1.6. Yeah. You know, we have 2.0 that is going to be coming hopefully next summer. Mm-hmm. It'll That's be a our, whole different, but it'll ordeal. be, a, yeah, it'll be a whole different, yeah. like, like in terms of like functionality mm-hmm. and like, you know, some things that are going to be cool about it. We can't necessarily sh- say yet because it's not ready for market. Yeah. But we'll say that the 2.0 is good enough that the version one will still be around. Yes. Which is pretty awesome because yeah. then you get two different price points. Exactly. Yeah. That's and, a good, um, uh, and, you know, but with it, you know, on the 1.0, like 
we've made so many incremental things and now we're at like 1.6 yep. and like we're working on stuff right now because we've got some great customers that mm. follow up with us and go, Hey, have you thought of this? Right. And yeah. they're not necessarily pointing out like problems. They're mm. pointing out ways to do it better. Yeah. Just like improvements. Yeah. Which but is the it, thing is, is there the, a way a user is going to use something, especially when you have thousands of users using them, mm-hmm. they're going to, they're going to find out things that you could just, it's impossible for you to test as a company or know about in various scenarios. Yeah. And then you start seeing patterns and then you're like, okay, we do need to fix that. Yep. Which it's like, you know, sometimes, you know, and then when you first start getting those issues, when you start a company, you know, the first thing that happens is you're like, oh shit, this is a big problem. But at the end of the day, it's like, is it though? Or do we just, is, is it impossible to see that? And now we have an opportunity to fix it. Yep. Let's just fix it, you know? And yep. then, you know, it becomes easier and easier, but also less and less stressful as you make improvements. And every time you do a production run, it's never a bad thing per, between production runs to make a tweak, especially if it's not a massive, you know, cost or massive, like a massive amount of time to implement the tweak. Mm-hmm. You might as well tweak that part and make it better Yeah, and improve it, you know? Yeah. So, and sometimes too, I think it's important to note that it's like, if you make a tweak mm-hmm. that you think is going to be beneficial... And like, it's not beneficial. It's also okay to go backwards. True. Like, like, like the plastic clip. Yeah. Like that <laughs> yeah. was an idea that we went through and we were like, yeah. this is going to be great. This it will like, solve rust. It looked better. It felt better mm-hmm. all around. And then it just had, you know, like a failure rate that yeah. was a little bit higher than what we wanted. And that led to like us, you know, missing a step in testing, but we all thought it would be better. Yeah. And Which then, happens you know, you but it becomes it becomes an opportunity to do two things. One, like reflect, go back to the drawing board, mm. and figure out you know mm-hmm. how you can t- instead of taking one step forward, you're now able to take like three to four steps forward. Yeah. By taking that one step back. Yeah. And you're also given an opportunity with like your customers to kind of you know coach them through the process, mm-hmm. be there for them, be a resource if they are the ones that are experiencing the issue. And also showing them that you do care about their opinion. Yep. Exactly. That's, that's a huge deal. Which as a small business like. You know, yeah. they're the lifeblood. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've all we that. are is just a brain. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's interesting when you, and you're doing this now, you know, talking about customer service on the way here, it's like, you know, when you're a founder and you're in the midst of everything, especially at the early stages and you hear all of that feedback, it'd be super stressful mm-hmm. and all of the customer complaints and stuff like that. But when you look at it, the grand scheme of things, a lot of times it's like, it could be like less than like 3%. Yeah. You know, so, you know, over time you replace yourself in that role, you hire customer service. And then what happens is you start getting data points of customer service of issues. And you look at it as a number that's a very small percentage, but you know, it's worth putting the effort into. And it's like, it almost changes the perspective around those issues versus the issues you hear right off the bat, which are like, Oh my God, what am I going to do about this? Yeah. And that's, that's when I think like being in the position that I'm in is I'm still very much owner operator. I'm the only yeah. full-time employee. Mm-hmm. We have a couple contractors that we work with that yeah. help out on a part-time basis. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard to do it all as a founder, but you're going to have to in some capacity in the early stages, unless oh, yeah. you have a partner. Um, yeah. And so with park it, like I was looking forward with new product iterations and things we need to fix. Mm-hmm. I was also looking backwards with like, here's the red flags that customers are bringing to attention. Yep. And there were definitely like days where to your point, like you get underwater in your head yeah. about like the things people are saying back. Yeah. And you're like, this one person wrote this like scathing email and you're like, you know, like the things that they wrote fundamentally about the product can be improved. Yeah. I agree with them Were they rude about it. A little, a little bit. bit. They might have just had a bad day. Yeah. And I, you I and, and you know, yeah. that's one of the things that you have to learn as the founder is like, you have to read through the, the personality mm-hmm. and find like the grit of what it is that they're explaining their problem is. Yeah. And the then go solve takeaways. that problem. Don't get caught up in like the language they're using. Yeah. Don't get caught up in the emotion. You can read through their email, mm-hmm. like get mostly focused into this is the problem. This is the solution. Is this a one-time fix for this specific customer because they did something weird with the product? Mm-hmm. Or is this like a long-term fix that we should implement into an engineering tweak? Yep. And like you have to think of it from that perspective because if you let the emotional side of it win, 
mm-hmm. it'll bog you down. Yeah. And I'm not saying Which it can, gonna, it, it, it's tough to get over that though. Yeah. And I'm not going to say you're going to win that battle every day. Cause right. I know I certainly haven't. I've gone to bed yeah. at night and looked at my fiance and been like, what are we doing? Yeah. And then I've also, you know, come home and like, I just want to high five and like, mm-hmm. you know, go celebrate with a nice dinner and mm-hmm. like Strong watch the sunset sales. and be like, we just had like the yeah. biggest day of sales we've ever had. And, or mm-hmm. this person reached out to us about an inquiry cause they want to do a collab and mm-hmm. like all these good things are coming and you know, those bad things are going to exist. You just yeah. have to be able to read through them and, you know, the, get the other thing though, too, about it is a lot of the consumers don't understand how long it takes to fix those issues. No, they, they take, they could take like a year. And you know in my I mean? head too, I still think they should take like, you know, a month. <laughs> yeah. They, but the thing is, is like you fix it, you test it, you prototype it, you mm-hmm. test it, you tweak it. And then, you know, and then you have to get reset up your manufacturing for it, you know, like, you know, make the new mold, you know, get the mold sample tested, and then you have to do a production run. And, you know, and then you have all the freight time. So by the time you actually have a warehouse filled with the issue fixed, I mean, it could be a year from when you first hear yeah. about the issue. The fastest that I think, like, a business at Parkett's current scale would be, and to give some context around that, like, we're entering year two and we're forecast to do close to 2 million this year. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that like we turn solutions probably like nine months, which yeah, is that's crazy. Good. That's, the, that's good. Which, but you're also small and it, nimble and able to make decisions without any bureaucracy too, which is an yeah. advantage, you know, versus like the bigger companies. I mean, there's so many layers where, you know, there's approval, there's budget approval, there's this, there's that, you know, there's so many variables. So it is like nice to be nimble and take advantage of it yeah. while you can, yeah. you know? So uh, the analogy that, and this is half the reason why I stepped away from the Oakley's and Quicksilver's of the mm-hmm. world was that I couldn't handle the pace at which things moved. Yeah. And someone once looked at me and said, yeah, that's because they're cruise ships. You ever yeah. seen a cruise ship park itself? And I said, no. Yeah. <laughs> and they said it needs like 17 tugboats. Yeah. And I was like, okay, 17 is a little bit of an exaggeration, but they need other yeah. boats to park this boat. Mm-hmm. And they got to coordinate those things. And you got to get those boats in position. You got to get those lines tied. And yeah. that's all time consuming. Mm-hmm. You're a small business, you're a power boat. Mm-hmm. You're, cent- you're a center console. You, yeah. you ramp it up, you pull it back down, you spin it, you can park it, you can park the boat by yourself if you need to. Yeah. And you be, know? being nimble like that is an advantage, you and, know, for initial that, growth. It could also be. Um, painful at the same time. Yes, because it's very make easy a decision to run out of quickly, gas. Yeah, that, but also you like you you make a decision quickly, not thinking about you know what could happen after you make the decision, and then it's like, well, yeah. that decision was a bad decision. We talked about this earlier on the drive here too. What did yeah. I call it? Sales, sales fatigue? Or, no, 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 no. What did I call it? I had a good term for it. It's blanking for me right now. It's like it, sales level thinking. Get the deal yes, over the finish yeah, yeah, line. Yeah, yeah. I yep. don't care what happens after yeah, yeah. the finish line, but it get the deal over the finish line. That you needed a little bit more engineering level thinking. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, yeah. Supply chain level thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Those are all great points. Um, okay. So, you, you, you know, where you're at now, um, now you've been selling for over a year, right? Yep. Two years, right? Yeah. We've been selling. Uh, yeah. We're at two and a half years of selling. Yeah. Two and, and a half years of selling. A year and a half of delivering. Year and a half delivering. So, you know, thinking about, and you're technically still a one product company, um, but now you're starting to think about expansion. You're talking to other channels. You're talking to uh, about, you know, getting into B2B type scenarios, Mm -hmm. right? So now in the midst of, of growing outward outside of just your existing product line, you know, what, what are you learning, uh, through that? Like think about like your custom deals, for example, and then do you uh, d- have you thought of a name for any of the future version? Or you're not going to talk about that. Um, I do have a couple ideas for names. Actually, this is actually cool, and you may probably want to include this part in the story. But like the name for the actual chair, mm-hmm. um, like the chair is called the Voyager. Yeah, and the way that that name came about was I was actually like. I'm a big kind of like space nerd, like closet space nerd. Okay. I don't, you know, know That's anything cool. about physics. Yeah, yeah, I love I what, you. you know, but I... You I, like the sci-fi stuff then? I like the sci-fi stuff. Yeah. I like like the, like Interstellar did a great job. I felt like explaining yeah. some of the stuff that you learned about in Netflix documentaries, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's And cool. relativity and like I get into all that stuff. Uh-huh. And um, I got into a whole documentary on the Voyager uh, space satellites that we okay. launched back yeah. in the 70s. Yeah. 
And one, they're the furthest things we've ever launched in the space. And the idea around the chair was like, this is a chair you can take wherever you want. Mm -hmm. So it was like, take it as far in the woods as you want. Yeah. You know, that was kind of the first thing alignment on it that I really liked. And then do you know about the golden record? No. So on the Voyager space shuttles, um, there is a golden record that the like engineers at NASA like built and the golden record, if you can figure out how to play it and like, you can Google it and like, there's a whole, it'll explain to you like the symbols on it and whatnot. And there's like, we basically sent a message in a bottle out to space. Okay. And we were like, Hey, if an alien tractor beam picks this up yeah. and like sucks it into its ship, they'll be able to open it and find this golden record. And based off the symbols that we've put there, if they're like a critically thinking species and the laws of physics still exist, mm -hmm. they'll be able to figure out how to play this. And when you play it, it has like sounds of animals, sounds of like thunderstorms. Oh, wow. Um, like, so showing our environment, our people life laughing, forms. crying, in different wow. languages. Did you know about this? I've never heard of this. That's yeah, cool. It's really cool. And in fact, like they actually picked, um, like they, they put music on it too. Cause it's a record and yeah, like it's if you're able culture. to, they also like put images on it. So if they figure out how to like, you know, rip the images off the golden record, like they're going to get wow. photos of earth and people Wait, and doing what? stuff. Okay. That's but, cool. um, they like put music on it. So they put like Beethoven and like mm -hmm. all this classical stuff. Mm -hmm. And at the time it's the seventies. So like rock and roll is rampant. Okay. And, um, they like talk about how they have this big debate in like the team at NASA about like what rock and roll song they were going to put on it to represent like the era. Mm -hmm. And like, it's the seventies. So like try to guess what you think it would be. Cause it's not what you think it is. I hope it's not like something like Led Zeppelin. It's not Led Zeppelin. Okay. So your, your hope is your hope has been achieved. Hopefully. Is it like something like ACDC or something? Nope. Not ACDC either. What is it? It's Johnny be good. Oh, okay. So that's the song yeah, that if, a good one. if they figure it out, <laughs> All right. Johnny B. Good's going to be going burner. Back to the future. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be like, what is this? Yeah. But it's just like, like it. But it's a cool story in the sense that, like, yeah, we sent these things as the furthest thing we've spent in the space. Yeah. And they've sent back cool photos of, like, you know, the gas giants. And, mm. like, I think now the most recent news is that it's, like, actually exited, like, our solar system. That's crazy. Um, so that's what it's named after. And that's what the chair's named man. after. So that, are you going to have that theme throughout, you think? Or have you thought about that? I was thinking about it and like I kind of want to, I don't know if I'll do a Sputnik <laughs> I'm just one. Kidding. That's um, Russia. Is it Russia? Yeah, it is yeah, Russia. Yeah, you don't want to do that one. Yeah. That was a big deal for us. Cause suddenly yeah. we were like, Whoa, cold war. They can fire things in the space and yeah. we can't yet. Um, see space nerd. But, yeah. uh, yeah, I, I've, I've thought about keeping it in line with it. I haven't found anything that I like yet. Mm -hmm. And I really liked that the Voyager like story told about how like, there's this record on it that like brings the world together. Like if we That's were cool. one world or that, brings the, the everything together. Yeah. If we were Not one even world, just that, our sent world. A, that sent a message to, you know, to yeah. space. Yeah. Like it's not a reflection of the United States of America. Yeah, it's a reflection. It's of a reflection of the world. That's cool. And like the chairs facilitate the opportunity mm -hmm. for us to sit around campfires and tell yeah, stories yeah. of snowboarding. And days they do and that all over the world. world. And people do it, that all over the except world too. For I learned in China, you know, spending time with the team in China, that they don't really do camping there as much. It's not like a normal. It's not normal. It's thing. growing, Isn't and it? I know that because have you asked April and them. Or, you know, not or, that. Not that. Not from. I haven't learned any of this from our team. Going, yeah, we yeah. have one Kickstarter backer from China. Okay. Who keeps asking for more chairs? Oh well, hopefully they're not. They're looking for the right reasons. <laughs> well, he sent me. This is where it gets fun. He yeah. has a retail store. Oh, okay. That's cool. a camping store. Cool. And he, so that's a really unique store in China. Yeah. Yeah. And he sends us photos of the things they do. Yeah. And the events are getting bigger and bigger so they, and bigger. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Cause there's so much beauty in China. Yeah. And you know, yeah. Camping's not like a, as normal as like here. It's, you know, obviously it's like people go on a weekly basis. Like oh, Izzy, yeah. Izzy goes all the time. I mean, in Utah, <laughs> you guys have people that probably work in like a corporate office that camp actually every yeah. night living in their converted sprinter vans with AC and probably, running water yeah. and, yeah. you know, showers Which in China. That's like, just not, that's thing. not a thing yet. Yeah. But it wasn't a thing in America too. Like remember the whole cliche of down by the river on Saturday night live. Yeah. Okay. And it was like, oh, if you live in a van, like you're the hobo that lives down by the river. Not anymore. And if like at the same time as that was happening, you could go to Europe, yeah. rent a camper van, pull up into these camper van communities and you'd have like, you know, like New England, 50, 60 year olds renting a camper van, driving the French countryside next yeah. to like 20 year old college kids renting a camper van, driving the 
French countryside. Well, it was like fully accepted in Europe first. Yeah. And then it made and its way it's here. everywhere. And Australia was actually the first place I really saw it. That makes sense. So yeah, Australia loves it. This is where I, I think that branding is so powerful. Mm-hmm. Is branding and building that personification into your business. Mm. It's it's what's going to gravitate people to you versus mm-hmm. you having to go out and find it. Yeah. And as a you know as an e-commerce business. Like we're constantly competing for eyeballs on the internet and Mm -hmm. we're trying to get people to find us, which is getting harder and harder. And one of the things that has been really interesting for us is that our product has caught in the eyes of like a lot of, you know, alcohol brands, um, some action sports brands in terms Mm -hmm. of collaborations, Mm -hmm. um, gifting companies, real Mm -hmm. estate companies. Yeah. Like, and people have been hitting us up about doing like, either custom chairs Mm -hmm. or buying, you know, a bulk amount of chairs. Yeah. And it it organically built this like extra channel for us Mm -hmm. that we call, you know, corporate collaborations. Yeah. And there's like three tiers to it. The tier number one is you need chairs for your, you know, the office is gifts. And so you get us up and you buy 24 of them from us and we Mm -hmm. ship them straight out of the warehouse. Yep. The second one is like, you know, you're a liquor brand and you want to give these to dealers as an incentive for buying X amount of cases. And mm-hmm. so you hit us up and you want to buy, you know, 50 of them and you want to put these patches on them with your logo. And we can do all that fulfillment now. We have mm-hmm. a whole process for it. We have a, a design. We get that mocked up. We show you what that looks like and mm-hmm. you approve it. And then we get the order into production and we co-brand the chairs. Yeah. And then we have the third level, which is actually the most cost effective. It sounds like it should be the most expensive, but it's mm-hmm. the most cost effective from a per unit cost is like fully custom factory direct. Yeah. And so if you're planned out and your lead times are as like good as they can be, mm-hmm. like you can get a full container of chairs shipped to wherever it is that you are with your branding, your yeah. pattern, your design, your you logo. Packaging or you do the normal packaging? Uh, it really depends on what they want to use them for. Yeah. You know, if they're using them for resale, then cool. Like let's collaborate on packaging if you're using them for just like you know these are going to be you know seating in your food truck arena or these are going to be chairs that you use at your you know movie nights and Mm -hmm. your whatever it is that you're going to use them for Mm -hmm. um you know we can figure that out along the way but it's Mm -hmm. been really cool to just see that program just kind of naturally occur like we didn't it was never part of the business plan and Mm -hmm. i think next year it'll probably make up like 10 percent of total That's a sales, good chunk, which is shocking. Yeah, because you have to think as a brand that wants to do giveaways or do something that represents them and their brand standards are similar to yours. You know, instead of going and getting the cheap you know, existing chair that's already out there or like another, another cheap chair just from Alibaba or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, they're going to, they, they would rather spend the extra money and, and do a premium product that represents them of what their real product actually is. Exactly. So it makes sense. It's been really cool to just see that come to life. And, um, you know, now it's like the sky's the limit kind of when it comes mm-hmm. to the, can- like the, like the customizations of this chair. Like we've done a few things for at the factory level that we've gotten the test and prototype. And mm-hmm. like the way that we kind of tell people it is it's like, you want to do a custom chair? Cool. Pretend the webbing is an open canvas. It's blank white. You just bought it at Michael's and you have the paintbrush. Like, yeah. what do you want to do? That's cool. Get their graphic designers to work on it. Yeah. Now that we have the, the more custom you know, detailed printing option too. Mm-hmm. So that'll be, uh, that'll be hot. Or what did, uh, what did you say? Vibrant? No, no, it's passionate. It's passionate design. Passionate. It's very passionate design. Well, um, let's, do you want to talk about what's next or do you want to keep that secret? No, what's next is actually like what I've been like when we first like, let's do the podcast. And you were like, let's talk on the history. I was like, I haven't talked about the history in a long time because mm-hmm. I've been so focused on like the future. Yeah, now you're in like the, the uh, yeah, the growth phases. Yeah, you're so, to market. Yeah, we're to we're to market. <laughs> you're paying the bills. We're, you're paying uh, yourself a little bit. I'm sure. Yeah, you're finally good. got finally Get got a salary this stage. from it. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's like it's great. like I mentioned this earlier today when we were driving in from the airport, but like I think back like two and a half years ago when we launched on Kickstarter and I had probably a dozen digital marketing clients and mm-hmm. I was running the Kickstarter campaign and I was sleeping like seven hours a night. Maybe. And I'm a guy who that's likes great. sleep. Like I like that's sleep. A, I was going to say seven hours. That's pretty like, good for most. Like for me, I'm like, I'm like a, I go to bed at like <laughs> yeah. nine. I I'm wake up at like 6.30. Yeah. That's how so I, like I, I like my sleep. Yeah. And if I like 
like seven just for me is just like not a good headspace yeah or whatever it is i can do five mm-hmm. but not for an extended period of time yeah oh if i do five back to back to back i'll eventually crash and have like a like a full like yeah. 12 hour sleep but yeah so <laughs> i just i just remember like thinking to myself when when park it's like really cruising mm-hmm. like all this contracting work will fall off i'll mm-hmm. have time again mm-hmm. and that is not the case at all and now you have more now stuff i have more stuff to work, stuff to work yeah, on but it's yeah. all park it which is great i yeah. love that it's like singularly it's, focused focus. it's all kind of like where's the ship going your deadlines are set by you yes. which is probably the biggest you know factor because having client deadlines is tough yeah you know but when it's your own deadlines and you get to set the schedule it makes it a you know less or more stressful depending on how hard you are on yourself i'm pretty hard on myself <laughs> yeah. um so yeah you know, i mean you move quick so i try to good. move quick yeah there's some days where i, I you know like like four o'clock comes and you hit your brain dead moment mm-hmm. and you still know that you're going to probably go until like eight thirty, nine o'clock yeah and you've got to like just take like a quick break mm-hmm. and so i'll walk the dog and like reset yeah. or yeah. like you know like try to find some time to like surf for a quick hour and yeah. get a little bit of like you know just a body and brain reset. Mm-hmm. And, um, while I'm doing that reset, I'll be like, well, what have you gotten done? And you know, it's like Wednesday and yeah. I'm like, well, we launched a new website theme on Monday. We ran two email campaigns the last mm-hmm. two days. We have an SMS campaign going here. I have graphics to do here. Customer service stuff is this fulfillment has a container coming and we're unloading that tomorrow. And you're like, oh wow, I did do all that. Yeah. Like you kind of like black out. So then you get to chill for a second and realize that you did yeah. all that. But yeah. in the moment, you're very like, you're almost blacked out and you're just like, well, this is what needs to be done and you go. And yeah. You just Sometimes keep going. that's why I like checklists. Yeah. Because then you could actually see it. Yeah. It's tangible. When but, you check those boxes and you look at the end of the week and it's like, okay, I had 15 boxes here and I only have two left. Yeah. Those could wait till next week. The way that that was way, a big enough week. The way know? that I've been operating it is it's, I haven't even been running checklists. I have like, I have like, you know, you have your emails, but a lot of my yeah. emails are project based. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like things are required for those. And so mm-hmm. as that depletes to like zero mm-hmm. and then I start sending emails to people, mm-hmm. I know I'm creating more work for myself Yeah, and I'm going to get responses back. So you like an, a zero inbox. Yeah. I'm a zero inbox guy. Yeah. I, I try to keep mine under 50. Yeah. Yeah. Cause sometimes there's just stuff I just don't want to reply to yet. Yeah. And the greatest about tool <laughs> everyone ever showed me for my inbox management and like getting things like just moving them was setting my Gmail to unread on top. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That completely changed yeah, the yeah. game for me. Cause all I of a sudden that. it was like, you didn't have to scroll through and like and find the emails that you need, no, you need to bust through. Yep. Yeah. That's how I keep And it. then I point. categorized everything being like the owner founder owner with no full-time employees. I categorize everything by like it's specific vertical. So it's yeah. like, and I color code everything too. Oh, wow. I'm like an I organized that. freak. That's um, great though. So sales is in like through it quicker. Yeah, sales is in pink, marketing's in green, uh, products in blue, logistics is in yellow, yeah. finances right. in red because like you you know most bills you're like waiting the last minute to get them yep. paid for yep. cash flow. Yeah, I get and, that. And um, they yep. get auto tagged when they come in based off the sender, mm-hmm. and then I can just open that specific folder yeah. and then turn on the finance brain and be like, this is everything we need to do yeah. for finance. I that can turn sense. on the product, so it allows me to like segment. I should probably do that. It allows me to segment like what I'm thinking and stay in that thought process Yeah. versus like jumping from a marketing thing to a product thing, to a logistics thing, back to a marketing thing. Cause that's where my days would get in disarray. And that's well, my ADHD brain that sometimes does work better that way. Yeah. I can't, but it's hard for me to focus on one thing for, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's why I sit around myself with operators. But the future for park it is like, you know, like, um, we're at the stage now where, like we know we have something that works. Mm-hmm. We know we have the data that says the consumers like it. The consumers want it. Mm-hmm. Um, we're constantly evolving it and making it better as you know. Mm-hmm. And we're at the stage now where it's like, we need to really put some gas on the fire yep. and bring in some heads that like, see what this can be and mm-hmm. see, understand you, the vision that I have for it. Sophisticated help. Yeah. Sophisticated help is a good way to put it. Yeah. Like I've surrounded myself with sophisticated help. Yes. Like Izzy. Yeah. I you need, know. I need like probably three Izzy's. Yeah. Well, you don't need three product designers. That's, no, I don't need three product designers. Yeah, you already but. got, you already got at least one Izzy helping, you know, true, and Aaron. And, true. You know. But I just, you need, you need uh, uh, it sounds like you need operations. Yes. Help. Yeah. Yeah. Cause my, my, uh, that's a tough hire. It took me more, it took me more attempts to hire the right operations team than it was the other, you know, engineering design, stuff like that. Yeah. 
because it's hard to find, you know, an operations person that, you know, can align with a vision and, and focus on execution and not let anything cloud the, um, the vision Mm -hmm. or your vision. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Where, yeah, that's what I learned. Yeah. You're looking for like a, we're, we're in the position where we're looking for kind of like a first mate. Yeah. You know? Yep. So you go back to the ship. So you could just trust too. That's also the hard part. Yeah. When you start bringing on, you know, resources to actually be like, I can, I'm, I'm going to give you this and I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah. And if there's a mistake, you know, the hard, the, the, once you get to the point where it's like, if there's a mistake, I'll help you fix it, but you can't worry about a mistake happening mm-hmm. or them doing it a way that you don't like. Cause you know, they won't know immediately until they do it and you give them feedback and they do it right the next time. So that's always like hard to overcome. Yeah. And it's like, it's one of the things too, where like, you know, it so intimately mm-hmm. that like, you just have to remember they won't know what that intimately no, for a while. For, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, it's like, I, I think back to like contracting and the, mm-hmm. and then getting looped in with like the marketing team mm-hmm. as a contractor. And yeah. like, you know, you're working with X amount of clients, which means you go to X amount of people mm-hmm. for X amount of responses to specific questions you have, be it like email or web or whatever it is. Yeah. And a lot of those companies aren't very organized where it's like one point of contact works with our contractors. They take that information and telephone it to the rest of our, our execution team, yeah. et cetera. Right. Like there's ways that communication mm-hmm. can be efficiently like moved through a business to like external partners. Mm-hmm. And a lot of companies that in like an early stage don't think about that. Yeah. And so that can make things messy and jumbled. And it's like, okay, well, I know right now exactly who I email for what problem and what part of the supply chain. Mm-hmm. And that new person's not going to know. Yeah. And like, what is that? And we operate on such like a quick, fast turnaround with like pre-orders coming in, yeah. having to get these out to people fast, mm-hmm. running marketing messaging around them mm-hmm. that like those questions and those answers need to be found quick. Yeah. And it's like the learning curve of like being patient with it is hard for me specifically. Yeah, I mean, you're going to be forced to figure it out. Yeah. You know, there's no way to avoid it. Yeah. But and it might take trial and error, but I mean, that's always the case, right? Yep. But getting that operations person in there will be good. Mm-hmm. Um, that'll allow me to focus on sales and marketing, which is where I like to be. Yep. I feel like the last year I've like become more of a CFO and a COO. Yeah. than I ever thought I ever would be, which I'm well, glad. As a founder, though, if you don't do that, you 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 fail. Yeah, that's what people you know. That's you, you kind of are. If you're if you're you're forced to learn it, and if you don't put the effort in to learn it, then you fail. Yep. And I mean, yeah, you can hire an accountant. You can hire, um, you know, like contract, just you know, controller or, or a bookkeeper and mm-hmm. stuff. But at the end of the day, if you can't look at your P and L's and your balance sheets and, you know, have an idea of what is happening or what's not happening or, you know, whatever, you know, what they're doing for you by getting your books organized is pointless. Yep. You know, so the, you know, that, that helps. Uh, one of the greatest tools that I got, um, in regards to like becoming more of a CFO was, mm-hmm. um, like there's tons of different debt facilities out there. Yeah to, you know, either fund inventory Mm -hmm. or fund product design or like fund marketing spend. They're Mm -hmm. all over the place. Mm -hmm. And, um, we were working with this one group trying to figure out if we were going to finalize a deal with them. Mm -hmm. And ultimately like the payback period was faster than we wanted for our stages of of business. We need that cash flow to kind of extend, expand a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. But he, the the way that we found that out was actually a tool that he gave me. And he was like, this is our cash flow forecast template that we build for every business that we partner with. That's great. And we build this in a uniformed look. So that way, like we can look at any business that's in our portfolio Mm -hmm. and like we can assess it. Yeah. And he's like, fill this out as best you can Mm -hmm. and like get into it. I'd never built a cash flow forecast. I just like understood like, all right, well the P and L needs to look positive and Mm -hmm. the income at the end and the balances and the liabilities should, you know, balance out and Mm -hmm. equity should, not be too heavy in the red as a, but as a startup, it's going to be a little bit upside down. Yeah. And, um, having him give me that template, like gave me a chance to like sit down and be like, all right, well, Mm -hmm. based off of our marketing metrics, what are those top numbers of sales going to look like just for Mm e-commerce? And then it was like, all right, well, what have we learned about our wholesale channels slash like this corporate collaborations channel? Mm -hmm. How is that going to be impacted into it? 
Mm -hmm. And then I took all that and I like re-engineered everything backwards from like, how many units are we going to need mm -hmm. to fulfill that? What's our average like shipping time and all the logistics stuff that goes into it, the timelines associated it, when those bills are going to come due, mm -hmm. map that into like then like the SG and A stuff that we had already like categorized in QuickBooks and then like kind of aggregated all that out. And I looked at it and went, oh my God, now I know my number. Yeah. Like, this is the amount of capital we need to hit these goals. For how long too? In this amount of time. For also, this is our burn rate mm -hmm. if we're going the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. And like when, you know, and like right now, like with freight doing what it did. Yeah. When we first filled this out with him, we had a burn rate. Yeah. Which I'm like, I don't want to take on debt with a burn rate. Mm -hmm. So I figured out a different way to do it. And, you know, part of that being a small company and being nimble and being able to pivot. Mm -hmm. And also not taking on too much debt mm -hmm. or too little debt mm -hmm. where then you're, you take it on and then you have to ask for more mm -hmm. or taking on too much where your payback period gets to the point where your interest just keeps hurting you. Yep. You know, but there are, I mean, good thing like in our day and age and a lot of these things that have come out like debt tools that have come out in the last like five years for e-commerce where they understand the model of an e-commerce brand versus like a retail yep. brand where like early on, you know, even five, six, seven years ago, a lot of the debt tools were built around like retail brands mm -hmm. and like net terms for PO financing and stuff like that. So like thinking that, you know, well, I don't know where your sales are going to be. You know, like you don't have a physical order. Yeah. It's like, well, I sell this many a day and it's like, oh, well, what's going to stop that? And it's like, but the last year you could see my historical data and you can, you can I see can the trends too, tell you exactly how much I'm paying you back. And summer yeah, exactly. and spring and, and it's like, so, so now, but, but it's, so it's nice to have, you know, debt resources that, you know, one connect to your website. Yeah. You know, like, so they get all the data they need. Yeah. Um, and then per set up payback periods where it's either a percentage of sales or it's, um, you know, it's stretched out in a way that, you know, you know that you're going to be able to pay it off in exactly six months. And here's the exact cost of that loan yep. versus like, well, I can only afford the minimum. So I'm going to be paying interest for way longer than I expected. Mm -hmm. You know, I always thought, so I, I do like where that stuff is heading these days. And the, the biggest thing that I see is the, you know, like as a company, especially at your size too, and like Derive, for example, like if we're not using those resources, we're either not going to grow or we're going to have a very big catastrophic event that yep. could hurt us. Yeah. Um, and one of those being, you know, like how much stockouts hurt us. Yeah. You know, they suck. Yeah. Same. We deal with that. Like we're five times sold out in two years. Yeah. And that's, it's like, you know, you see it as a good thing from the outside a lot of times, but when you're inside and you are stocked out and you know that you're not running ads, you're not, collecting that data or you're still running ads or you're, and you're still, still running, running ads, ads data pre sales but and stuff. you're like you know yeah. your your conversion changes because yeah. oh, the yeah. customer wants to buy it today and they want to yeah. get it tomorrow thanks amazon you'll see conversion go from like three percent to like 0.8 percent yeah and you know like and that, those ads are way more expensive and that and that know? at the same time too it's like you watch that per the conversion rate drop because consumers don't want to wait yeah and like well, is your ROAS still profitable? Is your ROAS still profitable? Well, yeah. if your ROAS is still profitable, then like let's keep spending. Let's keep doing this because we need to get the cash into the business to actually like one of the things that we've I joke about is like basically Park has been running a Kickstarter campaign for two and a half years. It is every we've time been, you fund a container. <laughs> we we've like we've had multiple shipments come in from our factory where like the container gets to our warehouse at mm -hmm. eight AM. And we straight up call FedEx and say, bring us a truck. And they yeah. drive over with their FedEx truck and they drop the trailer and the truck driver drives away. And yeah. we set up a foldable table and that's got all the labels on it. And yeah. we just empty straight from the container to that table. You Someone labels it and throws it into a guy yeah. inside the FedEx truck. It doesn't yeah. even see our warehouse. It keep, yeah, well, it keeps your warehouse floor empty. Yeah, the logistics <laughs> yeah. guy recently told me it's called cross docking. Yeah, we've done that a few times. And Thankfully, like we were, I think... Well, hiring an operations resource mm -hmm. with Dry, um, you know, Katie, who, who like really focuses on ever since I brought her on, she was able to spend a lot of time in the projections and like the inventory calculations and then focusing on um, the financials, the POs, the amount that needs to be purchased and the data around that and stuff like that. Um, 
that's and then also leveraging a debt resource. We use Wayflyer. I don't yeah. know if you of them. Yeah. So I was yeah. actually going to bring them up because they actually have a super cool dashboard that mm-hmm. like connects with like Google Ads, mm-hmm. Google Analytics, Facebook mm-hmm. Ads, Shopify, yeah. any other revenue channels. Like they have like the gamut of API connections. Yeah. And then it actually will like spit out for you this dashboard that like you get access to basically mm-hmm. through going through like the the debt pitch. Mm-hmm that you can go back and look at. And it's like, here's your historicals. Here's your CAC to LTV. Here's yeah. your, like it had all of that in that dashboard. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is like the tool that I've been looking for. Yeah. And it like also aggregates everything. It makes them more comfortable in giving you debt. And it makes me more comfortable working with them exactly. because I feel more it's confident about, tool. you know, the business. It's a great tool. Yeah. But like having, having those resources buttoned up and then having someone's sole focus, cause it's easy as a founder to not order enough, which mm-hmm. I did or to not have, to only think about cash in the bank and not order enough. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And it's it's like, well, it's, and then you get in a cycle where it's like, well, I did sell through them, you know? And then um, versus having someone that's basically sole focus is on keeping things in stock and the decisions around it and how they're being made. I mean, that's what prevented, we, we don't have very many stock outs anymore. Yeah. And that's been, you know, that's been very, it's been a big pivot for the company. And that's a big goal for us moving into next summer mm-hmm. is like, you know, staggering our POs in a way where we know those timelines and, and shipping also the last year and a half made that a nightmare. Yeah, that's like exactly your, the time your product- frame of it, not projecting for it, taking a month longer mm-hmm. than expected, especially when you're doing pre-sales. I mean, just look it. at how many, how many companies last year got their products after Christmas. Right. And as a countermeasure this year. Mm-hmm everyone's warehouses are overstocked right now. Right. Like the word on the street is that the deals are going to be crazy this year because right. people are just sitting on inventory that they didn't think they're going to get until, True. you know, late or November it, or, or sales are slowing because of all the news about the recession and stuff like that. Yeah. But you which know. I have a theory on that too. Not necessarily. I'm not, you know, we don't need to get into economics here because I'm not an economic expert Me by either. any means. <laughs> but um, I do notice that sales trend with the news cycles and mm-hmm. then it has about a two week attrition period. So if the news is freaking I out about see recession, about two weeks. That sounds about right. If the news is freaking out about recession, just wait two weeks. Yeah, you get a two week bump, and then it comes, kind of settles back. And it goes right back to normal. Yeah, and then like something hits That's it. That's a good and point. It's like, I've seen oh, that. Russia's invading Ukraine. Everyone mm-hmm. freaks out, mm-hmm. and sales drop because you know people are worried of some yeah. cyber attacks. So they go to the bank and get cash out. I, mm-hmm. I did that um, yeah. <laughs> little panic moment, yeah. but you know, like two weeks later everyone had kind of forgotten and sales were cranking again and Mm -hmm. things were moving no differently than they were. And And usually it's like when those happen, we've scaled back ad spend a little bit Mm -hmm. and then we'll kind of crank it back up as the conversion comes back. Yeah. Yeah. But that's all, uh, the levers of digital marketing, the levers of digital marketing. Yeah. One of the things that I like to like to share kind of in part of my background that we didn't really cover is that when I was at Oakley and Quicksilver, Mm -hmm. I didn't actually work in digital. I worked on the trade marketing side of things. Is it like field marketing? Yeah. So yeah. that's like when you walk in the Dick's Sporting Goods and you see like the cool displays with yeah. like the sunglasses in them and the cue cards and the marketing mm-hmm. stuff in that. Mm-hmm. And so like my job was mostly about like personifying the brand in the retail marketplace. Making sure they're sticking to the standards. Yes. That's it. Cool. I and, didn't know um, that. I thought it was more... Uh, like event focused stuff. No, I, I wanted to do event stuff, yeah. but uh, that's not yeah. the, that's not where I landed. Yeah. But, but that's um, a good mix of sales and marketing at the same time. I mean, time. you got to do events because like your stuff was at events, but you weren't like the event guy. Like yeah. Oakley had cool event guys that, mm-hmm. and they still do where they get their like own Ford F-150 that's tripped yeah. out with like all the graphics. They're yeah. badass trucks. But um, like I was there during Facebook's like, we have an ad platform moment. Oh, and I remember like seeing that going, this is cool. Yeah. And my grandfather had been asking me forever because he's a Wall Street guy. And he's like, how does Facebook make money? Why is Facebook stock so high? And I'm like, yeah. I don't know. I really don't know. I go yeah. on it. At the time, it was like my friends put in and send an invite to parties. And yeah. that's how we organize our social life. So this would have been. Um, this is like 2013, 2014. Okay. Yeah. So when ads were really starting to mm-hmm. spool up. And uh like I got caught wind of like Facebook ads and yeah. I like I caught wind of this one guy said, yeah, like they have this tool called a pixel. This pixel like knows your information, like what you like. Uh-huh. So then when you click it and then you buy it, it then goes, well, let me find 50,000 more people that like match this profile demographic. Yeah. And I was like, well, that's really cool. Yeah. Like if I know that guys with cowboy hats like to buy boots 
Yeah. And I can find people who like Garth Brooks and I can find people yeah. who like, you know, Kenny Chesney. Yeah. The lookalikes. Like that was like the mind shit. That was for me where I was like, I got to get into this stuff. Uh-huh. And that's where I started like teaching myself all Did of it. Did you do that on the side it. then? That's where I started doing it on the side. Yeah. But like, um, yeah, that's a good aha moment. Like that was a thing that yeah. like, now you look at it and you're like, how on earth did we do things before the data came back? Like because well, how was direct to consumer done? Not even direct to consumer. How was traditional marketing done? Right. Because the way yeah. that we did certain projects at Oakley were like, Hey, we have a new goggle. Yeah. What do we want to do to sell this goggle? And it was like, let's make a magazine TV. ads, not even a magazine ad. <laughs> yeah. We made a TV yeah. that was, you know, the size of this wall. Yeah. That was in the shape of a goggle that mm-hmm. on one half shows you what the competitor's lenses looked like. And on the other half was like, oh, you know, this cool. overly contrast thing. Yeah. We built 15 of them. We shipped mm-hmm. them around the country. Mm-hmm. We have no idea like what those did for like yeah. sell through. Did they, they convert bumped anything? Yeah. Like, did, that, that, that data just didn't exist. Untrackable. And like when Nike yeah. put just do it in Sports Illustrated, if you've read Shoe Dog, like mm-hmm. they were like, we don't know. Yeah. We have no idea. Now you and I could like run a test on five different slogans. We could have an exactly answer in a which week. which one performs. And we can put that slogan in the advertising ad. Yeah. They've made it too easy. Yeah. It's and too like many, uh, those levers. Drop to... shippers from TikTok selling uh, Alibaba stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're clouding then, our ad space for us people yep. that are actually making stuff. <laughs> <You know? laughs> no offense. More fidget spinners on the way. Maybe a little offense to them. Anyway. Okay. So let's... Uh, then what... Maybe it's good to wrap up with like the some main field notes that you've learned, you know, from the start, you know, halfway through, and then some things that, you know, you've recently learned, especially getting into the more scaling side of the business. So things that I would add to like my field notes Bible, um, I would definitely the, a lot of the cliche things mm-hmm. like ignorance is definitely bliss. Mm-hmm. Um, I had no idea what making a large product would entail. Mm-hmm. Um, knowing what I know now, I would definitely try to think of something a little bit smaller. Like what I did with the golf tool. Yes. You see what I did there? Yeah. <laughs> like, like I remember uh, coming across a belt company mm. and they sold like $250 belts but they could ship it USPS flat rate box for five bucks, two bucks yeah, or cheaper. Yeah. And I was like, well, that's cool because I ship one of these chairs. It's not two bucks, five bucks, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so that was one of the things where it's like ignorance is bliss Mm -hmm. and like, Mm -hmm. like kind of being green to something like is kind of fun because Mm -hmm. you're going to learn a lot along the way and Mm -hmm. it's only going to prepare you for like how to think about the business better in the future. Yeah. And then maybe on your, you know, the next project or the future things you work on, you know, you're not going to make that mistake again. Yeah. And you'll make something that's small and efficient. Like, yeah, that's why I did the golf tool. But also at the <laughs> same time, now that I know how to do something big, like I saw a thing for like a mm. guy, people were taking oil barrels and turning them into smokers. Okay. And I was like, this could be really cool. Mm-hmm. And like, you run all like the barbecue branding and like, yeah. you know, got these oil barrels and it's an upcycled project too. Yeah. That could be really cool. That's cool. Yeah. And I know how to ship big stuff Mm -hmm. and I know how to price big stuff in accordance with shipping and Mm -hmm. what I need to look for and how to be aware of that. Yeah. And so it's like, so it's like you kind of get two edges of the sword where you get to be like, well, I know in the future, small things can be better marginalized, Mm -hmm. but I also know how to capitalize on something large. So there's kind of like the give and take to that. And the, the best part of point of advice there is that, you know, I would never have known that if I wasn't ignorant to all of it. Yeah. Um, the other part that I would tap into is like, you got to bet on yourself every Mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that like they talk about it. And if you get fed Instagram, like entrepreneurial content, they talk about it. But Mm -hmm. like the best way that I've ever phrased it is that you're betting on yourself. Yeah. And if you don't bet on yourself, you can't win. Yeah. And if nobody like, and that's kind of the beauty of like a good boss, a good boss is betting on you. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're going to inspire you and they're going to, they're going to level you up and that's going to give you like the confidence to become who you are in your career. Yeah. As an entrepreneur, you have no boss. Yeah. So you have to be that, you know, it also gives you the most control. And you have to remember that Mm -hmm. when you're taking a bet on yourself, you are in control. You have a lot more control over the outcome. Yeah. So it's like, you know, and and use the fact that you're betting on yourself to motivate yourself. Yep. Because if you go in with and and go in with the mindset of like I'm not confident in my ability to do this, then you're gonna fail. Yeah. You have to know that, 
you know, if I'm going to make this bet on myself and the, the first solution I try doesn't work, then I'm, you know, I have to have the confidence that I'm going to try two or three more times till I do figure out what works. Yeah. And that's what does it. Yep. You know, cause you know, it doesn't work first try it really ever. Yeah. Something goes wrong. Yeah. Something always breaks. Yeah. And then it's like, that's a good point. But so you got to, that was one of the things that I would bet on yourself. That would, yeah. So the first thing is ignorance is bliss. Go into it and just like positive and accept that you're going to learn, be it and like sponge up what you can learn. And then, cause it's all going to come back to something later. Mm -hmm. Steve jobs has a good speech about connecting the dots. If you haven't seen the Stanford commencement address, yeah. like highly recommend go watch that. Mm -hmm. Uh, very valuable 25 minutes of your time. Yeah. I've seen that. That's and, good. um, like those dots feed into the ignorance is bliss side of things. Mm -hmm. The bet on yourself has to like, you touched on that perfectly. That's like Gary V yeah. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, but like, it's all, it's like, it's, it's like, that's what I mean. it's like, it sounds cliche, but all of that is real. It's real. It's super yeah, real. You feel it like on a, even little things, mm -hmm. you know? And then the other part of it is it's like, you know, persistence is key. Mm -hmm. Like you have to be patient. To, my fraternity. Um, one of the things you had to do, you know, as a pledge is you had to, memorize the persistence quote from Calvin Coolidge. And we had to memorize stuff too. Not that, but I remember. Yeah. That was one of the things we had to, days. <laughs> that was one of the things we had to memorize was that yeah. quote. And, yeah. um, like that, I didn't understand. Like at the time I was like, yeah, persistence, never give up like good mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you get into like, you know, the, the weeds of building your own business and you're mm -hmm. like, this is what he meant. It tires you out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It tires you out. Cause you wake up and it's like, not like the problems have gone away No, the next day. And sometimes, like, some problems take so long to uh, solve, mm -hmm. like months and months and months. And then, you know, by the time you solve it, it's like a huge relief. But at the same time, you know, those those problems that take that long are a lot of times that push people out. Yeah, 100%. And it sucks, you know. And I think the uh, the thing about some of those bigger problems, too, is it's like you can get really caught up in solving smaller problems mm -hmm. faster. Yeah. But, like how much of the needle did those move? Yeah. And you have to stay disciplined and like, no, this is the big problem mm -hmm. that we know by solving this big problem, mm -hmm. that's going to give us the confidence to do this with the capital resources we have. Yeah. Instead of little band-aids. Yeah. Which yeah. is, and that's going to give us, then the next step is like, that's going to give us the opportunity to mm -hmm. do X, Y, and Z thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, you know, as a founder, you have to be, you also have to be really cautious about when you decide to do certain things. Yeah. And I think, Part of that comes from the fact that I actually am surrounded by a bunch of sales guys. Mm. Like my best friends are all sales reps for digital marketing agencies, mm -hmm. real estate. You know, like at one point we all worked for a solar company and went door to door and sold solar. Okay. That's that good was experience. a little college internship thing that get all of us did. a bunch of no's, you know, that yeah, helps. Yeah, no a million times. <laughs> it and, definitely um, helps with your salesman skills. I hated it. Some of those guys loved it. And that's mm -hmm. when I knew I was more of a marketing guy and I wanted to create the magnet versus, mm -hmm. you know, go out there and knock doors. Yeah. But they're all sales oriented. And so they very much so like think about like, what can I get today? And in get like deal and being in an entrepreneur, you're not thinking about what you can get today. You're thinking about like what you have today yeah. can be facilitated to get you where you want to be in six months. Right. How does that you then have facilitate to very long term, very long term. Yeah. And in the, like that can be anxiety inducing too. Um, it can also be really exciting. Like there's two sides to that, you know, where you're looking at it and you're like, we can get here, but we got to hit these goals. How do we hit these goals? And you look at all of that and you know, you ultimately you make it happen. Yeah. But, uh, well, you're forced to, because it's kind of your, everything you have going on relies on it. Yes. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of like, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, that's where some of the times you look at entrepreneurship and you're like, maybe that's not for everyone. Mm -hmm. And like, I, am of the school of thought now that I'm in it and doing it. Like, I think it is for everyone. Like mm -hmm. you get so much freedom and autonomy and like, you're your own boss. Yeah. But at the same time, like you I could deal also with problems be a part that, of it in other ways, you know, I deal with problems that a lot of my peer group are like, no, I never thought about debt financing. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. And then it's like, you know, so it's, it's a change. It'll change exactly like what you're thinking about and what you're conversating about. And mm -hmm. that is, I think like a really unique position to be in where you can speak to just so many different facets mm -hmm. of business. Like yeah. you're really becoming like, like a, like a professor of business. You have to learn, you kind of have to be like a, a little bit of Jack of all trades, not necessarily, 
to execute on everything, but at least be able to have enough understanding to, to manage everything. Yes. Or, you know, work with a group that's doing this or hire this person that's doing that. Like if you don't, it's hard to manage it if you don't have at least a high level understanding. Yeah. You know, and sometimes that means you do have to like get your, you know, roll your sleeves up and do it yourself for a little bit. Yeah. And then figure it out. And then, okay, at least I'm comfortable enough to manage it, even though I'm not great at it. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to leave behind? You can find us at www.parkitmovement.com. Yeah, that's right. plug. Yeah, well, I'll include links and stuff. Yeah. Park it, parkitmovement.com. Yep, parkitmovement.com. Yeah. Our chair is The Voyager. The Voyager. We've been sold out five times, so if it's in stock and your favorite style is there, I advise you snag it. That's good. Yeah. From their yeah. company, and then if you put it on the it was a publishing house. Room. Cool. Beautiful. With the author. That's great. All right, so a few takeaways from this episode with Stephen. Ignorance is bliss. You don't know what you don't know. Sometimes you do have to dive in and figure it out as you go. I am one to build the plane on the way down as I fall. Not the best quality to have, but sometimes you have to and be open-minded and just know that you don't know. <laughs> and the only way you're going to know is by figuring it out. The other good point that I thought he mentioned, which I'm also a big believer in, is you have to bet on yourself. You know, Otherwise, you'll never win. You know, you have to take the leap. And of course, persistence is key. You know, it, it, you don't launch a product and it, you have to be so persistent to get that thing to market. And not only after you get it to market, but you have to be persistent to grow it and market it and continue to build something out of it versus as soon as you slow down, you lose that momentum and you're climbing back up that mountain. So persistence is key. Another really good point that he mentioned that I totally agree with is to focus on the big problems and not let the little problems get in the way. Because there are a ton of little problems when you're building. And if those distract you from the big problems, you're going to make much less progress versus staying disciplined on knocking down the big items. And then, of course, when starting, it's important that you're a jack of all trades, or at least as much as a jack of all trades as you can be. Of course, you can't be perfect at everything, but once you get going and start figuring out the things that maybe you're not efficient with or great at, that's when you start hiring those other roles and delegating. Um, but at the beginning, it does help to work around all of the things needed, get a high level understanding of what it takes to execute upon it, which makes it easier to manage in the future anyway and give you an idea of knowing what you want out of that team member that you bring on. Okay, and that's it. Those are some good notes from Steven. Uh, great conversation. It's always awesome when he comes to visit us from California. Uh, glad we got the opportunity to connect and talk about the main takeaways from what he's learned building Park It and growing it to what it's become today. Thanks for listening. Follow us on all the social channels here. Please subscribe. <laughs>